Welcome to Tech Leaders Today with your host, Kathy Crossley. All comments, views, and opinions expressed on this show are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers. Now here's Kathy Crossley. Hello and welcome to Tech Leaders Today. I'm here with Yasha Franklin Hodge, who in 2014 was appointed as the City of Boston's Chief Information Officer by Mayor Martin Walsh. As Chief Information Officer, he leads the city's efforts to enhance online service delivery, empower city employees with effective digital tools, and improve access to technology and the internet for all of Boston's neighborhoods. Prior to his work with the city, Yasha co-founded Blue State Digital BSD in 2004 and ran BSD's Boston Technology Office. He oversaw the development and operation of the BSD tools, an online fundraising email and CRM platform that powered the digital presence of President Barack Obama's 2008 and 2012 campaigns. Welcome, Yasha. Hi, glad to be here. I'm so happy that you're here because I have been very interested ever since I heard you talk at a Boston Sim event last year. I'm very interested in learning more about how you've taken your previous roles and brought them to the city of Boston as the CIO. But I wanted to take a couple questions on the people that are working with you in the CIO office. Technology people attraction and retention. It's a mix, especially in the government field, of people with government experience and without government experience. So what are you doing to attract and retain people in the city of Boston? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, talent is a challenge for everyone who works in technology, uh, and it's doubly true in the public sector because we don't have necessarily the ability to attract people with big salaries or the same salaries they might be able to earn elsewhere. You know, we also struggle sometimes because government work and government technology work isn't always something that people look at as something that's sexy or something that they, they want to be doing. I think there's often an assumption that if you work in technology and government, you're working on technology from 10 or 20 years ago, and uh, you're sort of in a really structured environment where you don't get to be creative. But what I've seen in my time in government is that That is actually very far from the truth. A lot of what we are doing here in the city of Boston is incredibly cutting edge. We're uh, using the very latest web technologies to build digital experiences for constituents. We are building sophisticated predictive analytics models to help us deliver city services. When we think about talent, I mean, one of the first things we think about is really just telling our story in a way that helps dispel some of the myths and some of the preconceptions that people might have about government work. The other part of that, too, is really helping people see the opportunity that they have when they work in government to have an impact on their world. You know, many of the technologists that I know and have worked with over my career are people who love technology, but they don't just love it for technology's sake. They love the way in which technology can change things about the world, whether it's changing the way people go about living their day, whether it's helping to solve a major social problem, whether that's getting people more engaged in their community. There's so many ways in which technology can have a positive impact. And inside government, we have this incredible opportunity, Um, especially at the city level. We see, uh, you know, you interact, if you live in a city like Boston, you interact with city government all day, every day. It's where you send your kids to school. It's the streets you drive or walk on. It's the public safety people who keep you safe, uh, who fight crime, who respond when there's a medical emergency. Government is interwoven into the fabric of urban life. And so the opportunity for technologists working in government is to make those experiences great for constituents and to help make sure that the services people get and the interactions they have are positive, that they reflect all that's possible with the use of technology. So we do a lot to really try to tell that story and get to people who maybe wouldn't have thought of themselves going to work for government. We also think partly it's a challenge of recruiting, and uh, we're we're focused on that. But we also think a lot about the staff that we have. Um, you know, we have some incredible people, some who have been with the city for a year, some who've been with us for decades. But how do we help all of those people stay engaged with their work? How do we help them keep their skills up to date? How do we make sure that we're actually getting the most for the people of Boston out of uh, our workforce? 
So we're investing in programs to help do professional development. We're encouraging people to go to conferences, to expand their network. We're trying to make sure that we give people access to opportunities to use new technologies that will help them burnish their skills and add to the capabilities that they can bring to bear on their work. So we think very holistically about talent and hiring, but at the end of the day, there's no more important part of what we do than getting the right people in the right place, because without that, everything else just doesn't happen. When you're looking for new talent, are you generally taking new university graduates or are you finding a mixture? Where are you looking for that pool of applicants? Yeah, it's a mix. We've had actually some really good success recruiting people out of the private sector who are called on the mission to help make the city a better place. And we've had people who, you know, I'm sick of building websites for banks. And not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but sometimes people are looking for a career change that gives them an opportunity to do something that is more personally meaningful. And I think we can often provide that. We do a lot of partnerships with local universities and with university students from all over the country. We have a summer fellowship program that gives people the opportunity to come in and work on our digital teams, our analytics team, and do an interesting project for six weeks and kind of get a taste for what life is like inside of government. For some people, that's a summer experience, but uh, we've hired quite a few people who have started with the city uh, on a summer project and kind of uh, got hooked and uh, realized what a huge opportunity they had to make an impact, how much responsibility they could have inside of a government job, and who decided once they graduated that they wanted to make a career out of it or at least start their career working in government. I've seen some cities are now doing hackathons. Have you attempted anything like that? Yeah, we've done a couple of hackathons, uh, one focused on improving the process for getting building permits and another focused on city data and how to analyze it and visualize it. It's been a great way to engage with technologists in the local community. We haven't really looked at that primarily as a recruiting effort. And I think hackathons, you know, they're a great way to get introduced, but it doesn't really expose people to sort of either the reality of what their daily life would be like inside of an organization so oftentimes people who go to hackathons are people that are gainfully and happily employed and, uh, you know, this is just, they want a hobby project. That said, we think building those relationships, building those networks, it, it helps people see in the technology community in Boston that, hey, you know, there's really cool stuff happening inside of government. And so even if they're not somebody we might recruit, they may tell their friend, hey, go, go talk to these guys. You know, there's some interesting folks over there and they're, they're doing neat work. Part of our, for lack of a better term, our marketing campaign for working in government technology is to do events like hackathons. If we move to the topic of technology, technology is so prevalent in everything we do. I can imagine for a city, whether it's 10,000 residents or 2 million, there are so many areas and technology initiatives going on or wanting mm -hmm. to be attempted. What is exciting you today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, as you say, I mean, we're really weaving technology into every aspect of how city government does business. But I think, you know, probably the most important way we're doing that is in the way that we are delivering services to our constituents. I mean, if you think about how you bank today or how you communicate with friends on the other side of the country uh, or how you shop, for most of us, those things have utterly transformed in the last 10 years. We all carry a connected computer around with us. We use social media sites that barely existed 10 years ago. For many of us, we do most of our daily business through mobile apps, banking and uh, shopping and you know, many of the even transportation with services like Lyft and Uber. So that transformation, I think, which has been so profound in so much of our everyday life, has not really been fully realized in government. One of our ambitions and our initiatives is to make every service that we offer available through digital channels. You know, we're always going to be here at City Hall and we're always going to have an open door and we'll, we'll welcome people to come visit us if they want to see us in person. But when we make somebody come to City Hall, when we tell them, hey, the only way you're going to get that critical service is to take two hours out of your day and take a train ride downtown and wait in the line, we're not doing our job and we're not meeting the expectations of the people we serve. 
So our goal has been to deliver digital services that are not only universal in the sense that they cover all of the different services government offers, but that they are exceptional in terms of the experience that they give people. Our goal here is not to just be good for government. It's to be good and good by the standards of you know all of the private sector apps and uh, online experiences that people are used to. So we started this effort by uh, rebuilding the City of Boston website from the ground up. Uh, we built a well-designed, mobile responsive site. Uh, we rewrote almost all of the content on the site to bring the reading level down to an eighth grade reading level to make sure that it was the content was accessible to uh, all of our constituents. We invested a lot in language and accessibility for the visually impaired. And that was kind of the foundational layer to say, look, if you type in boston.gov, you're going to have a great experience. Information is going to be organized in ways that make sense to you that don't require you to first learn what department does that thing or how you know different departments interact with each other or what the org structure looks like. You should be able to come on the website with whatever your question is or whatever your goal is and get it solved quickly. So we launched that site in July of 2016, and we've been doing multiple iterations and edits since then. And now we've undertaken an initiative to inventory every single one of the services that we offer where there is no digital version. And so far, we've uncovered uh, 344 different services where either you have to come in or you have to print out a PDF and mail it into us. In some cases, we're asking you to fax things. I don't know where anybody finds a fax machine anymore. And we've made this list, and we are working through one by one to build great digital versions of every single one of these services. And some of these are really small things, you know, requesting a CPR training for a community organization or getting a permit to have a wedding in a park. But when you take them as a whole, every time somebody encounters one of these things and they have to go through what feels like a outdated, decades-old bureaucratic hoop to get it done, it hurts their trust in government, it frustrates them, it wastes their time, and it leaves them in a place where they say, you know, oh, God, city government, they can't get anything right. By taking these on in a systematic way, our goal is to really help restore people's faith a bit so that when they do go to seek out a government service, our ideal reaction is that they are pleasantly surprised. They go, wow, that was really easy. That was how it should work or even better than I thought it was going to be. That's the aim of this initiative. And I think for us at the city level, you know, we're hoping to really be the model for what it means to be a truly customer oriented government organization. And, you know, we know that there are other cities and state governments that are working on this. And we think that effort is going to pay off in terms of people's trust in their government organizations and their, you know, their willingness to work with us and do the things, get the permits they need to get and get their business done quickly. How do you make sure that you don't end up with 344 different types of implementations, code base <laughs> methods? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're being really thoughtful about the tools that we deploy. I mean, there are some things that are very specialized. So building permits, for example, you know, that's an incredibly complicated business process that really requires specialty tools that are built just to support that process. But a lot of what we do are fairly straightforward things. Somebody sends in a form. Sometimes they need to make a payment. A person on the other end processes that. They might have to reach back out to the person. Or they complete a transaction. You know, they send them an acknowledgement that says this has been done. Or they send them a letter or a license or a permit or whatever it was that the person was requesting. For those, we're using standardized technology platforms to help support those common use patterns. We're trying to make use wherever possible of off-the-shelf software that is easy to use, is web-based, is software as a service. What we don't want to do is decide that, well, we're government, so we need these big and complex government systems, when really a lot of the work that we do is not that different from what a company or another organization might use. So by looking around and finding the technology that is easy to deploy, that software as a service, and using that for our common use cases, I think we can avoid the kind of explosion of platforms and different technologies that make it really hard to sustain over the long run. When you're doing software as a service, how do you ensure that it meets the security and the other rules, especially with data flowing back and forth, and what kind of governance do you have put in place for that? 
We have a data security model that allows us to evaluate both on-premises and software-as-a-service systems to understand what data we have, what the sensitivity of that data is, how we're protecting that data, how we're managing it throughout its life cycle, whether it's in transit from a customer or stored on a database or printed out in an office. You know, we have a framework that we use to evaluate those things. And uh, the same goes for software-as-a-service. I think there's, in some government organizations, there's an intrinsic distrust of SaaS and, and infrastructure as a service. And there's this sort of sense of, well, we can't control it, so we don't know what's going to happen with it. I think that, in some ways, a little bit of a false sense of security that comes from having software and data located on servers in your environment. Because while, yes, the servers are physically in your control, the question is, how much are you really investing in the security of that, the physical security, cybersecurity? And especially if you compare yourself to a large SaaS provider. You know, we're in the process of switching over to Salesforce for our 311 system, which is how we track constituent requests and the work orders that come from them. And if I look at how many people and how much money Salesforce spends securing their platform and their data compared to what the city of Boston can spend to secure what we have on premises, they are orders of magnitude larger than us. And I trust that they are orders of magnitude, or at least an order of magnitude better in terms of their ability to cover the full spectrum of risks that might be faced by the organization and their customers. So I actually think that if you choose your vendors wisely, if you evaluate their security practices, you can often end up with a much more secure environment than what you would have by keeping everything on premises. Going back to those 344 services, do you have a huge team of analysts that are working with your internal users to decide what needs to be part of the overall platform? I wish we had a, a, a huge team of analysts to work on it. We have a couple of people who are working on this, and this is where using you know well thought out off the shelf tools actually can speed things up because you know for a lot of these 344, they're one page forms that we're bringing into the digital era, and we have a tool called Seamless Docs, and there are other similar tools that make it really easy to build online forms, even ones that are a little more complex or that take payments. So we're able to do a lot with a limited number of people. There's certainly some of those 344 where what we're going to need is actually a lot more complicated. We might need to really design and implement a specialty system or go significantly beyond just a, you know what we can do with an off-the-shelf tool. You know, those things will get prioritized and we'll work through them as our enterprise applications team has capacity to do so. Um, but we're really trying to be smart about not treating everything like a big, massive enterprise undertaking. I mean, many of those are things that get filled out a few thousand times a year. The demands are not that complicated, either from a customer perspective or an internal workflow perspective. Uh, so we're trying to sort of divide them up and, and really be thoughtful about complexity and um, make good use of the resources that we have. But it will take time. It will be a project. I know we'll get through them all, but we're just going to work our way through that list. Are you finding areas that you can suggest opportunities to streamline certain areas? We're looking at this from two angles. I mean, first and foremost, we try to put the customer first. Our main mission with this project is to create great customer experiences. Now, in an ideal world, we would also be rethinking, in many cases, our internal business processes. We'd be thinking, what happens after that transaction gets submitted? How does it get processed? Who processes it? Is there duplication there? Are there places where we frequently have errors that cause customer frustration or cause wasted time? And how do we make those things better? And so we're uncovering a lot of that. But we're also not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, there's going to be a couple times, I'm sure, where we build a digital form that literally prints out a piece of paper in an office somewhere where that office is just not ready for an internal digital transformation, but where we know that we can create a better customer experience by creating that digital layer. That's not our ideal. And more often than not, what we find is that the departments we work with are hungry for better tools for themselves. They know that it's not efficient to be pushing pieces of paper around and spending time filing when they could be helping people. Where we can, we're, we're trying to build, as part of this project, tools for them that help them work a little bit more effectively in the digital realm. 
And sometimes that's really simple. I mean, one example we had uh, in our health department, we had a couple of forms where multiple transactions have been combined onto one form because they didn't want to have to produce a lot of extra paper. So at the top of the form, you'd check which transaction you were trying to do. You'd fill out all your contact information and then you'd fill out a different section of the form depending upon what your transaction was. Well, that meant that somebody, before you could even start solving the problem, somebody had to look at the form that the customer submitted and decide who it went to because these were different people that processed the different transactions. That was a human effort that was utterly unnecessary and it was literally done probably decades ago to save paper and printing costs. So when we saw that form, instead of just digitizing it as it was, we said, you know, this is actually four separate forms and we can do that online for zero cost and that will let us route all of the requests directly to the people who are prepared to solve them and save uh, some poor person at a front desk somewhere the work of having to read them and walk them down the hall. So little things like that we uncover all the time, as well as opportunities to really think about how to deploy technology that transforms the business of a department. We put those in the queue and work on those projects as we can. Are the constituents noticing the changes that you've made to the website or some of the services that you've already released? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done any formal research, but anecdotally, absolutely. Um, We get a ton of great positive feedback. We invite feedback on our website through our mobile app. You know, I see people all the time who will who will say, oh, you know, the parking app is amazing. Like I paid for my parking with a mobile app. Or one of the things that we digitized early was uh, the process of getting a moving van permit. And that was something that used to require you to not only come to City Hall, but you had to wait in two separate lines in two different departments in order to get a permit to park your moving van on the street. You know, the transportation department had to okay the location and the public works department had to issue the permit. Classic example of horrible an effective government where we've made people adapt themselves to our process and our structure rather than the other way around. So we digitized that process. We made it a simple online application and people got a permit in the mail, usually within a week or two of submitting the application. When we launched that, you know, for anybody who had been through this process before, you know, usually people cannot believe how difficult it is, are you know, often quite angry. So we got all of these tweets from people who had done it once the old way and had the chance to do it again the new way. And they said, oh, my God, this is amazing. It just showed up in the mail. They were tweeting pictures of their permits. It was uh, you know, really positive to kind of see and recognize that you know, even though that's a thing that for most people they do every few years at most, it matters. It matters that we can make somebody's life a little easier when they're trying to move. Already a stressful time. People really appreciate that. They see themselves being listened to by their government. They see their government working on their behalf when we deliver these services. And sometimes they're nice enough to reach out and say thank you or tell us about it or tell us what we got wrong. And uh, we take that feedback really seriously and uh, you know, really try to listen and engage with people to fix the things we still haven't figured out. I know you are doing so much for the city of Boston, you and your entire team, and just the whole city in general. I'm glad to hear that people are receiving all of the work that you're doing with primarily great response. That's fantastic. Do you have a preferred method for people to get in touch with you if they have comments? Of course, they should definitely go to boston.gov, boston.gov. Email is usually the best way to get in touch with me. I'm Yashra, J-A-S-C-H-A, at boston.gov, and I will always try to get back to you. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining me today, Yasha. Thank you, Cassie. It's great to be on. I want to thank you so much for listening today. If you love this podcast, please do share it with your friends and colleagues, and please leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, because it makes a difference for circulation. For the show notes and other great info, enter your email into the mailing list at techleaderstoday.com. Thank you.